I'm extremely happy to convene this panel uh, focused on human rights in times of COVID, uh, which is undoubtedly an extremely important issue affecting not only Ukraine, but the whole world. And I'm happy to present the distinguished panelists uh, of our panel. It will include uh, Professor Jeremy McBride, barrister at the Moncton Chambers with considerable experience in uh, human rights litigation. Uh, Professor McBride has also taught human rights, public international law and public law at several universities, including University of Birmingham, Cambridge, Oxford, as well as Central European University in Budapest, where I had the pleasure to be uh, a student of Professor McBride. Also among our panelists is Dr. Sandra Krahenman, a lecturer at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, and also thematic legal advisor at Geneva Call, international non-governmental organization uh, working on strengthening the respect uh, of humanitarian norms by armed non-state actors in order to uh, promote and improve the protection of civilians. Also, uh, Pavlo Pushkar, PhD, Division Head in the Council of Europe and the Directorate of General Human Rights and the Rule of Law. And last but not least, Andriy Kostyuk, Chairman of Advisory Board of the Ukrainian Catholic University Law School and Managing Partner of KPLT. Uh, I propose that we begin our panel with uh, the presentation from Dr. Sandra Krahenman who will present about the limitation of human rights in times of emergency, as well as equal access to healthcare and the vaccines. Uh, Dr. Krahenman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Taras, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm already going to make my apologies that I will have to leave immediately afterwards because I am teaching at 6 p.m. my time. So this is a, a speed panel. Um, and also I'm speaking obviously in my personal capacity and not as a thematic legal advisor of Geneva Call, as though more as an academic. Um, I don't want to go into too many details because also I know we have uh, Jeremy McBride here who has done a lot of litigation, so he knows probably much more about this. But just to set a little bit the scene for when we speak about human rights and the uh, response to COVID, I wanted to flag three points. No? So the first is, you know, that obviously COVID is a health crisis. And I think we should not forget that states do not only have negative obligations to respect human rights, but they also have a positive obligation to ensure the respect for human rights. Meaning that, you know, state inactivity in the face of uh, this health crisis would actually also be a concern from a human rights perspective. If the state had seen the crisis unfolding with many people getting sick and not taken any measures, I think we would still have the discussion we are having today, but from a very different angle. So I think that's something to be kept in mind as we analyze um, specific measures. Um, the second aspect is, as Atars explained, I, and I think we that's what part of the panel is about, of course, we have witnessed since March, and many of us are still living it, the extent to which there has been quite unprecedented, at least in my lifetime, quite unprecedented restrictions on individual human rights when it comes to public life, you know, the restrictions we have on, on freedom of assembly and to move around, to meet people. I think that has a, in, in my country, in Switzerland, that led to the, a lot of discussion of what this means for democracy itself, that uh, we are no longer able to participate in public life in a way how we would normally be doing, all at the same time, while as part of the democratic process, important debates are going on. Um, but we have more limited ways now to participate in that. Um, we have seen a lot of restrictions also in our private life and in our home life. Now with restriction of how many people you can receive, who you can see, which is quite unprecedented as well. And I think one other thing we should not forget, we have seen a lot of restrictions also on the right to ed education, particularly with the closures of schools and uh, children being homeschooled and everything that comes with that. So on its face, it's um, I could not myself imagine another 
of time. And then as Taurus has explained, you know, from a human rights perspective, of course, restrictions may be lawful depending that they fulfill certain requirements. So I don't want to go uh, into individual restrictions, but just to give you an overview of these conditions. Um, so of course, you know, they must be based on laws. And I think when we say based on law, we need to keep in mind that it's not just a question of a formal requirement, so not just to have a law, but that that law should actually have certain qualities and features, including also guarantees against abuse. Because as with any kind of emergency measure, that emergency measures quickly tend to become uh, permanent, and then they tend to be used in circumstances that are very different from what they were originally proposed for. And I think in some contexts, we have started to see this happening with measures against COVID. Um, as Taurus may know, my main expertise is on counterterrorism and human rights, which is a particular feature we have seen that emergency measures in the, in the fight against terrorism have become permanent and they have started to become uh, used in very different kinds of settings than the fight against terrorism. So I think that's something we may want to keep in mind. Um, and then of course they need to fulfill a legitimate objective. You know? And I think with the COVID response, we all agree it's a, it's a question of um, a healthcare emergency. Then the measures taken, they need to be necessary and proportionate to be able to achieve that. When I think about it with analogy of counterterrorism, there we would also say, you know, the longer a measure goes on, the more also you must, you would require the state to be able to adapt and to react in a different way or with more safeguards for human rights than when the measure was break or when the emergency started. I think today also we're in a different situation than in March when many of us and, and uh, when we knew less about the um, the the virus, you know less about the threats and states quite often didn't quite know you know how to react and then you would just do what, what other states did. Well now we are almost a year later and then you know more, you know more about how to um, prevent transmission and so on. And you would from a human rights perspective also expect it to see that reflected in the measures that are being taken. And then my last point on this is, um, at least in my country, a lot of the discussions around the restriction, they often make an analogy with, you know, generally individuals' rights to make decisions for their own health, you know, the, the, the right to refuse treatment, for example. They say, you know, uh, normally in a, in a hospital, you can refuse certain treatments, and normally they are complex legal aspects to that, but quite frequently would say, well, the individual's freedom of choice and the right to their own bodily integrity can prevail and it gives them a right to refuse treatment. In the context of the COVID response, I think that analogy does not really hold up that much in the sense that refusing measures or refusing treatment that could actually also be vaccine wouldn't just affect you individually and your own um, physical health, but it also has an impact on the community at large. And um, I think I will stop here in case there are questions and so on. Thank you, Sandra, for your quite enlightening and elaborate speech and for touching on so many important aspects. Uh, I will now turn the floor to Professor Jeremy McBride, uh, who will talk about the emergency powers, limitation of rights and the duty to protect in a pandemic, uh, focusing on the uh, legitimacy of invoking a derogation. And before I turn the floor to Jeremy McBride, I, I would like to thank Dr. Krahenman for finding the time to present it in our today's panel. And thank you in advance. I know that you have to leave for your classes. But thank you for being with us today. So, so Professor, Professor McBride, McBride, the floor, the floor is, yours. is yours. Thank you very much. Um, 
This is a complex issue, and uh, I agree with a lot of what's just been said by uh, Sandra. Um, you know, first, that's this issue of the health aspect is quite important in where you look at the question of emergency powers because of the issue of positive obligations. Um, and the difficulty with talking about positive obligations, particularly when you look at um, the, the past case law of the European Court is that we haven't been faced with a situation of this this character. There are situations where the state has failed to act and people have been uh, able to complain about the, the failure to act, but um, we are in a sense moving into uncharted territory where we have to suddenly work out what is the appropriate response. Now, there will be problems, I think, certainly will arise with some of the preparation states made, for example, in some countries where there was a failure to have adequate protective equipment, so there will be difficulties which will arise in relation to that. Now, I, I think, as Sandra said, this is definitely an emergency, although it's an emergency quite unlike any of the other emergencies which have arisen um, before the European Court of Human Rights, which have concerned issues particularly about terrorism. Um, this is fundamentally different, but I think there is no question that there has been an emergency situation. Um, what's been interesting about this emergency is that although some countries have adopted emergency powers, they haven't actually treated it as an emergency from the perspective of the European Convention on Human Rights. In other words, to, to justify possibly um, excessive restrictions which may be imposed. Um, there were in fact been 10 uh, member states of the Council of Europe which adopted derogations, um, but um, that leaves 37 others which have adopted very similar measures uh, and yet um, they, while possibly sometimes saying it's an emergency, they have not said there's a need to use um, extraordinary powers. Um, if you look at some of the case law of the court, you can see that there are elements of um, the treatment which has been adopted which might be used to allow restricting. So, for example, um, to test compulsorily people whether they have coronavirus might well be something which would be seen as an obligation um, provided by law, but comes back to the point that Sandra rightly made, which is the need to have proper law um, clearly prescribed. And that is, I think, one of the difficulties which we've seen with increased use of powers made under delegated authority uh, and often with inadequate scrutiny of, of those powers. So those issues will arise. Um, there have been issues of compulsory vaccination where this has been seen as justified, but this is still a question which will need to be much further explored. Um, the question of limitations on ability to uh, meet, to go out, uh, undoubtedly do affect the rights of liberty. Um, the, the variation, of course, has been from complete confinement of people to their homes um, and circumstances when they're able to go out for certain matters. And that would change the way in which you look at the issue, for example, whether it's really a deprivation of liberty under Article 5 or it's an interference with freedom of movement. The more, for example, that you have the possibility of going out at least for some hours during the day, the more likely it is, I think, the European Court would see this as an interference with freedom of movement. That doesn't mean to say it, it um, doesn't then have to be justified, but it may be easier to justify on that kind of, of basis. There's really only one case where you've had confinement to prevent the spread of infectious diseases, which was a case uh, concerned with um, the action taken against someone who had HIV. Um, and in that instance, it was held not to be justified because there was no evidence that this individual was at risk of propagating that particular uh, virus to other people. Um, the difficulty with coronavirus is that it's much more uh, difficult to work out how the transmission takes place. Um, in terms of HIV, you need a conscious act. In terms of coronavirus, that clearly isn't the case. So you have those kind of difficulties which arise. One of the problems that definitely um, arises is the question of panic, the fear that people will be affected by uh, 
articulate statements about the risks that exist. Um, and a number of countries have tried to adopt restrictions which will allow them to control the dissemination of information. Um, this was particularly true in a number of countries which adopted derogations where they tried in their derogation, although not actually so much in their practice, to centralise dissemination of information. And that, I think, is much harder to justify. Um, the situation is the need particularly to criticise the authorities in terms of what they're doing, to dispute their views. Um, there have been some cases where people have uh, been prosecuted for uh, what they say on social media in particular. Um, now in the current time, we have people disputing whether or not there is really a threat posed by coronavirus. But I think the question is whether or not that those kind of statements on social media are really likely to cause people not to do particular things or to incite them to do certain things. And I think you have to be very careful in, in seeking to justify that kind of information. And there may be a difference, um, if you look at the gay store of the European Court, between the way you would approach the situation of individuals posting material and the situation of organised media, where there is a clear responsibility of journalists to check the question that they have. So in those senses, um, there will be question marks about some of the restrictions which be imposed. The final thing I want to mention is, is the need for actually positive action in terms of another consequence about expression, which is the use of hate speech, which has followed from um, the presence of the virus. People, particularly from Asian countries, have been the target of um, the idea that they are personally responsible. And this gives rise to the need to look at whether or not sufficient measures have been taken to tackle such hate speech. Um, and it's clear from the case law of the European Court that there are some positive obligations to do that. And I think that's an area where serious problems still arise because it's very easy when you're in a state of panic to uh, speak unpleasantly about others. And you can see at an institutional level that came very much in the relationship between the UK and the European Union when there was a question of the shortage of vaccination. So that these, I think, are a number of the difficult issues which will arise. And I, I have no doubt that the European Court will be faced with a number of cases in the coming years. Already there are a number of communicated cases in which COVID has been mentioned, although most of them don't actually deal with the kind of restrictions which I've been referring to, but more I'm sure will follow. So at that point, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, my Professor McBride, for your presentation. Uh, I will now give the floor to Pavlo Pushkar, who will focus on the obligation under the European Convention of Human Rights in times of pandemic and the execution of the European Court of Human Rights judgment. Mr. Pushkar, the floor is yours. Uh, hello. Yes, I wasn't allowed to unmute myself uh, uh, by the organizer. So uh, now I hope uh, you can hear me. And uh, yes, uh, I will. Um, I will speak very briefly, probably, uh, on um, the issues that uh, uh, actually Jeremy has already covered a bit and probably focus uh, on several issues uh, relating to pandemic and its influence on the human rights situation in Europe and with some elements that pertain to Ukraine. Uh, one has to start probably and agree with the fact that indeed the pandemic uh, has changed our lives and the lives of the societies, European society as a whole. Uh, 
the human rights pandemic restrictions indeed they occurred on a wide scale basis and the main obvious reason for such restrictions was indeed the protection of health and rights of others and this was uh, one of the uh, most frequently cited uh, substantiations for the use of restriction of rights and uh, uh, one of the most cited uh, uh, ideas for the restrictions and basis is for the restrictions cited in the declarations made by a number of state parties. Jeremy has already mentioned that a number of declarations were made under the convention um, by uh, some states like Armenia, Estonia, Latvia, uh, Georgia, Albania, Romania, San Marino, Serbia. And th these restrictions, uh, uh, they ended in some situations, they, are, they were uh, prolonged uh, in some situations for some states in view of the ongoing pandemic situation and deterioration of the situation in, in the states concerned. But there is already a question, as Jeremy has uh, uh, already uh, mentioned, and I would fully subscribe to that point of view. Uh, there, there are some states who made these declarations, there are others who didn't and actually still impose these measures. So what kind of approach would the court choose in dealing with such cases uh, with uh, declarations already made? I'm not going to analyze in detail the declarations made on the various provisions of the convention. However, um, it has been a constant practice of the European Court of Human Rights uh, which has already communicated uh, more than a dozen of applications concerning various countries and the facts related to uh, COVID-19. It has been a practice uh, to assess uh, the compliance of the declarations or restrictions imposed uh, on rights through declarations or reservations, um, uh, to assess it on the compliance with the requirements of the convention in the first place, as well as to deal with the substance of the complaints if the court decides that these complaints would be admi admissible, notwithstanding the declarations made. I don't want to anticipate the outcomes of such cases. However, I would like to say that there are already now quite a number of elements that um, uh, um, available for this vivid academic discussion. And most obviously, the rights that are touched upon are the right to life, uh, prohibition of ill treatment in situations of poor conditions of detention, more specifically, lawfulness and length of detention, restrictions on fair hearing rights, right to privacy, freedom of religion and association, right to property is one of the rights cited in the cases communicated, for instance. These rights would be at the center of the discussions uh, by the court in the future. And uh, during the annual conference, uh, by the way, the president of the European Court of Human Rights has referred to the fact that a number of applications have already been lodged with the court uh, on these elements. I would possibly align myself, and that's something I intended to, to speak about. I, I don't want to, um, to go beyond the, the timing, but I wanted to, to focus specifically also on one of the rights that has been restricted in the course of the pandemic. And uh, I think uh, one has to speak about the phenomenon um, of manipulative information and disinformation that has been uh, spread throughout social media and quite frequently that was replicated in the classical media. Uh, of course, I'm speaking the special context of freedom of speech and uh, restrictions imposed in view of the COVID-19 uh, you know, pandemic by the states. Secondly, in this uh, sense, uh, I wanted to, to mention that it is quite important to speak about the limits of free speech in the context of the pandemic and the restrictions imposed. Um, and for instance, the discussions also mentioned by Professor McBride on, on the vaccinations or the spread of the pandemic, they are the ones that could be in the focus of uh, future uh, applications uh, lodged with the court or examined by the court. I'm not arguing in favor of um, uh, having restrictions or not having restrictions. On the contrary, I'm speaking more about the need in situations where restrictions seem to be logical and obviously necessary in order to protect general population of individuals uh, from the negative health effects of the pandemic to justify the restrictions in a proper manner and to substantiate them to allow a possibility for judicial review of the restrictions. These are very clear requirements of Article 10 of the Convention, and I think they are quite pertinent to the situation at hand. Uh, 
and uh, the respective relevant limits of the margin of appreciation allowed to the states as well as are a part of the principle of uh, subsidiarity, which is at the heart of the functioning of the European Convention on Human Rights uh, at the domestic level, more specifically. Lastly, speaking about implementation and functioning of the Convention institution, institutions, one cannot avoid speaking about uh, the execution process uh, and the impact of the COVID pandemic on the obligations arising for the respondent states under Article 46 of the Convention. First of all, one has to underline the unconditional character of the obligations arising from Article 6 of the Convention and the obligation, more specifically, to comply with the final and binding judgments of the court de delivered uh, against a specific state. Indeed, this obligation, obligation of restitution and integrum, cessation of a breach of the Convention and providing guarantees of non-repetition are uh, arising from the judgments of the court and especially they especially pertinent to situations of systemic and structural problems. Obviously, COVID had a negative impact on the pace of execution process for such cases. Uh, in some situations, the authorities referred to the difficulties arising from COVID and how they precluded compliance or made compliance difficult, protracting execution of judgments, delaying some measures of general nature. Committee of Ministers, as a body responsible for the supervision of execution of judgments, obviously took uh, these objective obstacles into flexibility to the measures of general nature in view of the COVID-related complexities. Unfortunately, this also concerns some Ukrainian cases, including the key pilot judgments uh, pending against Ukraine, cases of Ivanov Burmich and Sukachev, uh, concerning respectively uh, non-execution of the domestic court's judgments delivered against the state and poor conditions of detention. Notably, the situation of the pandemic caused serious budgetary cuts to the much needed reforms in the areas uh, that these judgments identified as problematic and thus undertakings of general measures. However, more generally, the standing of the Committee of Ministers seemed to suggest that the state's obligation uh, to comply with the judgments of the court, notwithstanding the pandemic difficulties, is still unconditional. And it has to be effectuated on the basis of the principles of good faith and pacta sum servanda. So the pandemic as such and the general situation of the pandemic is not an excuse for honoring uh, the obligation to comply with the final and binding judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. I would stop at this and would be happy to participate in the discussion. challenges and touch so many practical aspects related to human rights that this is impossible to cover in, our, in, in one hour. Our final speaker, however, will reflect on a more philosophical questions, uh, focusing on the dichotomy between uh, so-called first-generation human rights and second-generation human rights, or political and civil liberties and economic social rights respectively, and on the priorities and hierarchy of human rights and whether we shall trust more people or political institution. Mr. Kustyuk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Taras. <clears throat> Being the last speaker, you always have this privilege of uh, summarizing something or reflecting on uh, other people's uh, input, which is given already. And uh, I'm kind of uh, surprised how all the speakers were talking uh, the same direction and raising uh, the same concerns. Basically, the concern about uh, whether human rights in general are weakened or strengthened during the last year of the pandemic situation. You know, human rights basically come to the question at times like this. They came to question during the time of revolutions at the end of 18th century, and we got Bill of Rights of the US Constitution and Declaration of uh, Rights in the French Revolution. After the Second World War, we got discussion about human rights, which ended in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
and the UN as one of the guards of human rights. In my opinion, we are more or less on the same edge of our civilizational development. The last decade, we face a lot of uh, different uh, dangers, and these dangers were so systematic, for example, terrorist danger or money laundry, that only systematic international response was possible and this systematic international response was always in the direction of uh, imposing new rules, imposing new restrictions. Uh, after terrorist attacks uh, in 2001, we got the whole uh, bulk of legislation uh, which restricted uh, privacy, especially privacy of our electronic communication. We know that everything is recorded, everything is monitored. Now we are accustomed to this. Nobody cares anymore, but this is a new reality which 20 years ago nobody could have imagined that uh, basically there is no such right as uh, privacy of your letters, for example. There is no privacy of emails or of your tweets. It's, it's definitely over. Another thing is uh, financial privacy. At the time of banking secrecy, a gun, and perhaps for good reasons, uh, it's, we are declaring everything to tax authorities, to financial monitoring, we are always answering the questions and trying to whatever <coughs> pose uh, ourselves in front of different uh, authorities which check whether we have uh, done everything uh, lawfully in our financial transactions. Now we are on the edge of this uh, with our healthcare. Discussion about vaccination uh, is more and more sharp and uh, we will come to the con conclusion perhaps that uh, vaccination is obligatory at the same point of time. And then if you are not vaccinated, uh, you are not allowed to travel. In some places they will say you are not allowed to work, even to be employed uh, in a certain, uh, whatever, in a cafe or in a public institution or whatever else. So it will interfere with your labor rights. So at this point of time, we have really to think about our priorities. Because so-called first and second generation of human rights is really the question of how we approach the whole issue. Do we approach human rights, as it was historically the case, as our liberties, as our immunities, and the main target from which we have this immunity is basically the state, because the main abuser of human rights at the beginning of discussion of whatever natural or unalienable rights, this was king, state, police, somebody who using power can interfere and coerce you. After the Second World War, discussion between Western democracies and uh, Eastern Communist bloc was about the priority. So Western Americans, first of all, uh, diplomats were stressing that uh, you need to have liberties. President Truman was saying we have to live in the world free from coercion, the way of life which shall not be imposed. We fought Nazis who were intending to impose their will on us. Soviets were responding, it's quite okay, but you know, what are your political liberties worth in case if you are hungry or in case you are not educated or your health care system is not uh, free and cannot be accessed by poor people? So basically, human rights is about protection and providing uh, minimum bulk of services to the people. And we still have this discussion. We got two treaties on human rights, one 
civic and uh, personal rights, and another economic and social rights, precisely because of these two approaches. And now COVID and pandemic discussion is about the same thing again. To which extent we are ready to give up our immunities and our liberties in order to get more services, more protection, more state support. Another philosophical question, whom we are trying to trust in more? Is it more the question of trusting people or more question of trusting institutions? Who is more reliable? Of course, institutions have procedures, they have experts, Basically, we hope they are democratic, we can still influence them. Is it the case? Do we really so strongly believe that institutions uh, cannot be corrupt? Basically, human rights reports of UN say that most of the countries in this world are still very far from in the institutional development from uh, where well, we would like them to be including such countries as Ukraine, for example. Do we really think that we can give up personal immunities in order that they decide what the people are allowed to do or not? Just to mention one example, at the time of first lockdown in Ukraine, among different restrictions, there was a restriction on aged people to go out from their homes. So basically anybody who was uh, over 65 in April 2020 was not allowed to go out to the street from their homes. We have forgotten this, but it's very uh, remarkable uh, thing. So people having power are still people. If they want to protect us, if they want to do everything for the common good, they nevertheless can impose measures which are sometimes, even in case of emergency, obviously excessive. And this discussion about the limits of the state powers is uh, to be continued and to be continued uh, based on certain principles. What has priority? In other areas, we have the same uh, problems. For example, uh, Guantanamo case. US government tortured people who are supposedly terrorists in order to get information about the possible plans or about their allies, perhaps CIA people got valuable information from this terrorist. But where are they allowed? Can we do this? Can we torture people in order to prevent a terrorist attack uh, within the next 24 hours? Okay, perhaps the question of whether somebody still working at school can spread COVID is not the same burning issue as the question of terrorist attack uh, within 24 hours at that school. But this is the question of the same order, about the question of priority, whether human right, personal immunity has priority, or social welfare and general security has priority in this concrete situation. The question is not easy to answer. So I... Uh, Stop at this point and uh, just as the last sentence, I like to remind ourselves on a nice old saying, basically medieval saying, that uh, people are the only animals, the only creatures who, who can choose not the means to the ends, but the ends themselves. We can choose our goals. And the freedom to choose is something so precious, so valuable, that we shall not uh, give up this easily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kustiuk. i just like to mention that you probably stopped at the most interesting point of your presentation, posing all these 
question and then just saying that at this moment you will not provide any answer to those. Uh, the most of those questions. Indeed. People puzzle. Indeed. Uh, we still have 15 minutes, so if uh, anybody in the audience has any questions, then we can ask them to our presenters. And as a, a moderator, I'll, I will use my privilege and ask the first questions question to basically all the all the presenters. Uh, since uh, all of you touched in one way or another this issue of limitations, issue of restrictions, and mentioning also the the freedom of speech. So my question is whether it would be justified uh, under not only European Convention of Human Rights, but also uh, ICCPR, for example, uh, to limit freedom of speech of people who um, spread this disinformation or information regarding the the vaccines and all these uh, myths about the, the vaccines, so the, all these anti-vaccine activists and closing their accounts on social media and so on. So, uh, Dr. Krahenman, you are still with us, so maybe you will you will start. Well, Beth, thank you for a very fascinating discussion. I just told my students I'm going to be five minutes late because I couldn't leave. Um, before I answer your question, I just wanted to mention something that came to my mind um, during the discussion. And it's maybe an aspect to consider as well when we speak about the legitimate aim, you know, which is protection of health. Something I was struck with in, in the discourse we have seen in many countries is a restriction of the notion of health to physical health. While I think as the measures have been going on, we have also seen a parallel mental health emergency appearing. Um, and maybe that's something that needs to be considered as well, in particular for young people, also the elderly people, so that we do not fall into this trap of having a very narrow vision of what health means. On your question of freedom of expression, um, I mean, I'm mostly familiar with freedom of expression issues when it comes to incitement of violence. And I think Professor McCride, he alluded to that normally, you know, to restrict freedom of expression, it's a very contextualized assessment and there needs to be also a certain proximity of the risk that you create and by what you are saying. So I think for, we have never seen anything where it comes to discussions, anti-vaccine movements or so on. But I think it would be a fairly high bar then also to, to say, you know, this is actually a justified restrictions. More of a policy consideration um, is, you know, quite often faced with that kind of challenge, just restricting freedom of speech may not be the best approach because it tends then also to feed into a discourse of censorship. Um, the last point I wanted to make, and, and I think that's another layer of complexity because you mentioned social media, no? I think what we may be seeing is that social media um, platforms may themselves start to censor. And that would then be a slightly different issue in the sense of it's a term of use issue. Um, and there's a general concern about, you know, private companies being able to restrict freedom of expression themselves, also using different criteria than what we would normally request from states. And with that, I will stop and I'll say thank you very much to everybody involved. Um, it was really fascinating. Thank you, Taras, and I hope we can continue this discussion. Thank you, thank Sandra, you Sandra, and thank, thank you for staying, staying with us until the end. Uh, Professor McBride? I think much depends upon the nature of the, um, the expression. Um, there's, there are lots of differences between news that is, or voices that are fake. It's, I think it would be very difficult to justify restrictions on individuals saying vaccine is no good. I mean, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Uh, the question is whether it's something more orchestrated. And, and, and even if you're using social media, I don't see that that's a, a, a reason why people should be prevented from saying this is, is nonsense. I mean, just as they also, people, a lot of people say um, unfounded things about 
a, a whole range of issues. Um, but where you have um, media organizations which may be putting out clearly fake information. So, for example, saying that um, particular vaccines will lead to certain health consequences, which are patently unsubstantiated. Then, in those circumstances, I think that there might be a basis for some restrictions. But as Sandra was saying, you need to be very careful. And one of the other problems, I think, which would need to be weighed quite carefully is that the more you try to censor, the more you will create a sense that there is a conspiracy uh, and that will actually uh, undo the, the, the goal that you're trying to achieve. So there you are. Thank you, Thank you Professor, Professor Wright. Wright. Um, um, Mr. Mr. Carr. Yes, I think it's uh, very difficult to say that uh, just uh, closing down, down the media outlet or suppressing a particular instance of speech, uh, whatever it can be qualified, would be the only measure that would be appropriate in a situation of a pandemic. I think uh, there are multiple examples uh, of dealing with fake news, uh, malinformation, disinformation, and information chaos. And I think the role of the state in, in, in this situation as the role of the neutral regulator is very important. Uh, the state not only has to deal with uh, uh, untrue information, but also has an obligation to ensure that uh, correct information is circulated because people, they also have a right of access to information. Uh, and uh, that's something that has to be ensured. Uh, so there, there can be two obligations to regulate and on the other hand also to uh, provide the forum for, for uh, exchange of views on, on particular matters of public interest. I think uh, there are some examples where, of course, uh, uh, the restrictions on, um, on discussions that uh, undermine the efforts of the state in, in dealing with pandemic, uh, they are uh, being quite harshly addressed by the states. And on the other hand, I think it's the role of the state once again to ensure that there is uh, a viable uh, selection of tools to um, uh, rebut untrue information, rebut uh, fake information, to provide the public with correct information on a regular basis. And this is one of the core obligations in the course of the pandemic as well. So I think it's quite important to concentrate on that as a primary mean, rather than on suppression of information that might lead to uh, negative uh, outcomes. But indeed, I, I would subscribe uh, to what uh, Jeremy has referred to as well. It's quite difficult to speak about uh, it in abstract. I think it's much better to have a concrete uh, situation and concrete case uh, where um, untrue information is uh, being circulated. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Carr. Mr. Kustyuk. Just a few words about the freedom of speech. <clears throat> you know, this is uh, exactly the case. Why do we have the freedom of speech? Basically, it arose at the time when uh, censorship was normal thing. So the states, they like something to be said, and the other things they just don't like. And this is the same now. So sometimes uh, those having power like what is said in the media, sometimes they dislike. If they dislike, they would rather shut down this. And yeah, perhaps they dislike for good reasons. Perhaps uh, this is bad what is told by those who are criticizing the state. Perhaps this is not true, but at the time when the freedom of speech was raising to the level of natural right, unalienable right, now we call it human right, the thesis was that it, it is so important that rational being, free being, human being, has the right to say what he thinks, or what he wants to say. He shall not be shut down. So in that sense, for example, the whole discussion about hate speech uh, is burning. 
for example, US were not supporting those treaties which prohibit hate speech because the US said uh, we are for freedom of speech. It's very important for our culture. But then US ended in uh, closing down Trump account on the Twitter. So there are limits of whatever there are priorities. So for me, the freedom of speech, including uh, discussion about vaccination, uh, is another indicator of whom we are trusting. Are we trusting those who have power, and they call themselves institutions? Or are we trusting common sense and uh, free rationality of us as human beings? Thank you for your responses. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Can I can I just add one thing yes, uh, to, to this discussion very quickly? I think we are also omitting uh, the fact that uh, European Convention on Human Rights very much relies on the ideas of ethical journalism and fact-based journalism. So, uh, and I would also like to underline that the right uh, to freedom of expression under Article 10 is a right which can be restricted. So in a sense, uh, one can speak about uh, the possibility to restrict this right and this right not being unlimited right. Uh, and also, once again, the idea of ethical journalism and fact-based journalism is something that is very much a part of the European court's case law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there is no questions, then uh, yes, Professor McBride. Yeah, I'd like to come back to this question of priorities because I think that that's a very important question. Um, I, I accept that there was the whole dichotomy between East and West over economic and social and some political rights, but that really doesn't reflect, I think, the modern situation where if you look at what is happening within the framework of the Council of Europe, it's very clear that, that both sets of rights are of importance. And the emergence within the interpretation of the European Convention on Human Rights of a whole sense of positive obligations is precisely because we are prioritizing um, the need for good health, uh, the need for life even. Um, and this is some of the problems which will come out of the pandemic crisis, whether or not actually enough has been done. Uh, we talk about the restrictions on liberty, but that those restrictions on liberty are to secure health. Now, they may not all be justified and some of them may not be adequate. Um, and there are many areas where there have been particular problems. But I think the notion that there's only one perspective being looked at is, is wrong. The idea is very much to see that we should have um, both sets of rights being protected. Uh, thank, thank you, you Professor, Professor McBride. McBride. At, at this moment, I would like to maybe follow up with uh, the question I wanted to ask regarding the equal access to vaccines and also the positive obligation of states, but not only positive obligation of states towards its own citizens, but maybe on the more universal level. Because I distinctly remember when the disease was spreading all over the world, there were so many voices and reports that when the vaccine is developed, all the states should have equal access to, to the vaccines, because this is like we are in we are all in this together and the UN report on this issue. And then when vaccine was actually developed, then it immediately appeared that the developed rich countries had have much better access to it and countries that are developing go so called third world countries will be uh, will receive their their share of the vaccines much later. Uh, so uh, is this a human rights issue or is this merely a question of uh, economic possibilities of those states to to buy those vaccines or to develop those vaccines and maybe we can start with mr kustuk this time thank you so me for me this is again the same dichotomy it's still uh, somebody's property somebody's uh, inter intellectual property somebody has invested billions in order to develop this Unfortunately, this 
uh, the people who again have power and have money, the Western democracies and Western uh, superpowers. So yes, they have better access to this because they have produced it. The company Pfizer, the company AstraZeneca, they are all based there. If uh, there would be African uh, or whatever country, Latin America, who can develop uh, its own vaccine, they would supposedly vaccinate their own people first. So, in a sense, uh, it's the question of uh, freedom uh, of uh, economy of market of course it's good to be able to give to everybody not just bread but also vaccine so we hope that at the end of the day everybody will have the possibility to be vaccinated with good healthy cheap and reliable vaccine including all people in Africa, all people in Ukraine, all people in Asia. But uh, does the company Pfizer have strict obligation to distribute all the vaccines like numerically, for example, according to the number of population uh, in different countries, or can it freely choose with whom to conclude contract first and uh, what money basically to charge for one portion of the vaccine? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pushkar, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, I think um, the, the idea that uh, vaccinations and healthcare services should be provided to all, notwithstanding the uh, social uh, level of the person concerned or, or belonging to particular societal and social groups uh, that are deprived of access to medical care and are especially vulnerable it has been discussed a lot in Europe most recently even the European Court of Human Rights most recently dealt with a number of applications uh, coming from refugee camps uh, and uh, as regards migrants uh, um, issues of migration that uh, were relating to the COVID pandemic and I think um, more generally, the issues of protection of social rights became much more important in the discussions both before the Council of Europe and the European Union. And the, both of these organizations, they reconfirm at the political level that uh, access to vaccination has to be provided on equal footing, not only uh, to the so-called rich countries, but also to the poor countries. And I think we are coming back to this discussion which is still very important and it's becoming even more important in times of the pandemic and the, it will be very important in the aftermath uh, of the pandemic is the issue of poverty. Poverty and how to um, uh, combat poverty and what kind of measures can be taken both from the point of view of protection of fundamental rights such as for instance right to life or uh, right to privacy, right to healthcare, which is becoming more and more a part of this uh, right to privacy. So in a sense, uh, this uh, connotation between the fundamental rights and social rights, which had depicted in the European Social Charter, is, is becoming more and more actual. And uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, in April 2020, the European Social Rights Committee has adopted a statement of interpretation uh, on the right to protection of health in times of the pandemic, which gives guidance to the states uh, as to how they should uh, uh, treat their population and how they should provide health care in the times of the pandemic, it, with focus on especially vulnerable groups and uh, including those that are deprived of economic means. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor McBride? Yes, um, I think there's a difference between the situation of the companies, um, because in particular standards in relation to business and human rights are still rather weak. but. The, the issue of obligations to ensure distribution of the vaccines really are ones which apply to the states, and it's the states, therefore, dealing with their relationship with 
uh, the people who manufacture and supply the vaccines where those obligations arise. There are commitments made by members of the World Health Organization. Um, and so there are, uh, I think, obligations to ensure that there's distribution. So that's in terms of um, rights of solidarity, which do have some basis in international law. But separately, um, if we don't do it, it's also a question of, um, from a self-interested point of view, because if there isn't global vaccination, then return to what we used to describe as normal life will not be possible because as long as there are places where the vax where the virus can thrive, then we are all remaining at risk because as we've seen um, variants in the vaccine develop and they may become more difficult uh, to deal with. So we are not safe by assuming that we vaccinate all our people in our particular country. Uh, that isn't the end of the story by any means. Thank you, Professor McBride. And I think we, we already, already over exhausted our time. So I would like to thank to all the panelists for their speeches, for sharing with us their thoughts and ideas. And thank you to all of those who followed the discussion either in person or online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you very much, dear dear panelists, dear speakers, for this instance of integrating Europe academically, intellectually. I've been informed that we had we had Geneva here, we had London, we had uh, Strasbourg, we had Lviv at least. Perhaps perhaps we had we had more of that. And uh, now we're going to have a brief coffee break for 12 minutes and we resume at 7.30 Eastern European time, which is 12.30 in Washington for the conversation between Jose Casanova and Catherine Marshall, uh, two world-class scholars of Georgetown University. And that is going to be on uh, integral human development uh, and religion in, in the global world. Uh, thank you very much once again, and please be sure to stay with us. Thank you.